Hey everyone, this is Nick and just like every week I have to give you the latest Linux and open source news because if I didn't you probably would make your own list of RSS feeds and that would be way too much to ask. What do you mean no one uses RSS feeds anymore? Everybody's wrong then. Okay, so this week we have Fedora dropping support for older legacy BIOS. We have Nvidia dropping some open source code for drivers although their intent isn't exactly clear and we have more details about how Steam will run on Chrome OS. Let's get into it, but first, if you're interested in making sure that your organization is up to par in terms of Linux security best practices, you might want to listen to this message. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare, but this time I'm not going to talk to you about their services to handle and manage your Linux server fleet. This time, they want you to take a look at a report that they sponsored about Linux security best practices. This research was conducted by the independent Ponemon Institute and the results, which are freely downloadable, will let you benchmark your processes against a set of best practices. For example, research shows that organizations spend about 1,075 man hours monitoring and patching systems each week, including 340 hours of downtime to apply those patches. 45% of respondents also indicated that their organization has no tolerance for system patching downtime. Of course, that's a problem that Tuxcare solves with their live patching services, but if you want to learn more about Linux security best practices, how to implement them in your organization, head over to the link in the description below and download the full report for free. No strings attached. Okay, so it seems that Fedora wants to drop support for legacy BIOS, as in everything that's not based on UEFI. Fedora 37 will mark older BIOS installs as deprecated and new installs won't be possible on these architectures. Existing installs of Fedora will still be supported and will keep working, but your older devices won't be able to get a new, fresh Fedora install. While the move might seem surprising, it's driven by the fact that a lot of modern features depend on more recent UEFI BIOS, for example, Secure Boot support, or using the firmware update tool FWUPD. It also makes the installer and live session for Fedora way easier to maintain, as it allows the team to stop supporting an architecture that seems to require a range of ancient hacks and complex code to be at feature parity with UEFI. Fedora has always looked to the future and is generally one of the first main distros to implement new tech, so I'm not super surprised about that change, but I'm sure that it's going to piss a lot of people off though. What would these videos look like without more KDE news? We won't find out today as Nate Graham keeps on publishing articles detailing what the KDE team is working on. This time there's a new 15 minute bug fixed and changing accent colors will now be done with a smooth crossfade so the change is less jarring, much like what GNOME does when moving from light to dark mode. The info center in the system settings now displays more details about your device including the serial number or the product name and manufacturer. On Wayland, apps that need access to screen recording won't prompt you every time you open them. They'll remember that they got access once. There are also tons of bug fixes, as always, and a few user interface improvements for Eliza, the music player, as well as for Kate and Kwrite, which now share the same code base. And the four-finger swipe gesture used to open the KDE overview effect is now one-to-one, -one, so it follows your fingers. That's a lot of good stuff, and I really like seeing the portals being implemented. They really add a ton of polish and security to the desktop. It's top-notch. Raspberry Pi OS is getting some big updates. First, the setup wizard is now mandatory because it lets you create a user account on your system. The default Pi user made brute force attacks a bit too easy since each Raspberry Pi had the same username, so you only had to guess the password. People who wouldn't be able to see the graphical wizard also have a solution, of course. The Raspberry Pi Imager tool lets you pre-configure an image with the user already created. The team also added a way to rename the user for existing installs, so you won't have to reinstall the whole system to get the same level of security as if you had a fresh one. The wizard also allows you to pair a Bluetooth keyboard or mouse right from the start without plugging it in through USB, which should make the initial setup a bit less irritating. They also added experimental Wayland support, although it's not complete yet and more of a hybrid between Wayland and X. 
pretty good stuff all around and it should make these teeny tiny PCs a teeny tiny bit more secure. If your distro already graced you with GNOME 42 but you are using a few extensions that had not been updated yet, you can rejoice. Two of the major ones are now compatible with GNOME 42, namely Dash to Panel and Material Shell. Dash to Panel doesn't have any new features in their latest release, version 46, apart from being compatible again. You can install it from the GNOME extensions website or from Extension Manager, a great app I already talked about a few times. Users of Material Shell can also now move to GNOME 42 and enjoy its styling window manager-like features. For people who never heard about it, Material Shell automatically organizes your windows by tiling them to the various halves or corners of the screen, much like what you'd find on Pop! OS. It's also very keyboard friendly, of course, and can be installed as every other extension from the GNOME extensions website or from Extension Manager. So now you have no excuse to not move to the latest and greatest GNOME release. Nice. Linux Mint 21 revealed itself in more details. It will of course be based on Ubuntu 22.04 LTS still, and still supports Cinnamon, Mate, and XFC. But that's not all, its codename is Vanessa, and the team is working on a new upgrade tool to make moving from one version to the next even easier. It will be fully graphical and localized, as opposed to the current one that is only in English. It will perform a few checks to see if it's safe to upgrade, it automatically migrates your PPAs and repos to the right version if that exists, and it should generally be a much safer and cleaner approach to upgrading your system. Of course, you will be able to skip some of the checks the app performs if you're certain of what you're doing, like for example skipping the check to see if a time shift backup exists. It will also preserve the mirrors you might have picked for apt, so download speeds should be at their best for the upgrade. The tool will be made available for Linux Mint Debian Edition 4 to move to the latest version 5, and then it will roll out to Mint 20.3 to upgrade to Mint 21. It's nice to see distributions paying attention to the in-place upgrade process, because that can be pretty tricky, especially if you have tons of PPAs and repos which don't get migrated and break your libraries and stuff, it's a good choice. A few distros also got some nice updates this week. First is Endeavor OS, an Arch-based distro that sees its latest release, codenamed Apollo. It brings the Linux kernel version 5.17 and the Mesa 22 graphics drivers, so you should be all caught up in terms of hardware support. It also brings a new window manager called Worm. It seems to be made for X11 and not Wayland, and it supports tiling or floating windows. It's also very lightweight. You will also get a new graphical utility to pick the apps you want to install and a command line tool to install NVIDIA drivers. MX Linux also got a new release, version 21.1. It's based on Debian 11 and packs the Linux kernel 5.16, the disk utility right on the ISO, and it also improves the installer and updates most of the pre-installed packages. Both look pretty good, I might give them a shot in the future. I know the MX Linux crowd is pretty vocal about how they like their distro. Christian Schaller, the desktop lead at Red Hat, wrote a blog post detailing new things happening on Zinc, which is an OpenGL implementation that runs on top of Vulkan. Basically, it means that devices that don't have a native OpenGL driver, but only a Vulkan driver, can still have OpenGL support, because that thing is still widely used by our desktops and applications. This might seem like a minor development, but as manufacturers release new devices, they're progressively phasing out support for OpenGL and focusing on Vulkan, so this ensures that we'll keep compatibility for the time being. This new support will be included in Mesa 22.1 and will be made available on Fedora 36. Performance is still a bit slower than native OpenGL, but they expect that difference to shrink as the codebase becomes more refined. It seems important to maintain compatibility with older games and older apps, so I'm all for it. Speaking of drivers, it looks like NVIDIA is making another step towards open source. They released the code for their Tegra 4 driver for Linux, and this seems to be accompanied by a previously unseen kernel driver that's also open source, but not based on Nuvo. It actually includes references dating back to the 90s, so it might be a more all-encompassing driver for a lot of their GPUs. This new driver is licensed under the MIT license and it appears to be derived from their proprietary driver. 
For now, it's limited to Tegra graphics hardware support, and regular desktop GPUs don't work with it. But since it mentions a lot of these GPUs in its code, there might be hope that Nvidia has finally seen the light and will work on a complete open source driver in the future. Or maybe they just decided to not clean up a lot of the old code in the driver and I'm getting excited for nothing. Only time will tell. LXQt is a desktop environment I don't talk about much, so it's time to remedy that. The team published an article detailing changes to their next release, version 1.1.0. That was at the end of March, so sorry for missing it. This new version brings color palettes matching the dark themes, as well as two new menu choices, simple and compact. The latter, as you can guess, using a bit less horizontal space. There's also an improved color picker, a separate settings panel to configure the look of GTK apps, and they added some icons on the desktop by default, accompanied with a new theme, a new wallpaper, and new icons. LXQt 1.1 will also start the transition to Qt 6 and will support the portal spec that's used by a lot of Flatpak apps. I was inclined to give it a shot when it releases, but they added desktop icons. I need to think about it more. OBS is a wonderful tool, but its performance impact can be quite high, especially when recording gameplay footage. Fortunately, we might have a new solution in the works, called GPU Screen Recorder, a very descriptive name that aims to be the shadow play of Linux. It will start with NVIDIA and NVENC support initially, but the team has plans to make it work with AMD and Intel GPUs in the future. Initial performance tests seem to indicate that it does have a much smaller footprint than OBS and NVENC, and might not disturb gameplay as much. The reason the developers gave is that, while OBS does use the GPU to record the screen, each frame is still passed to the CPU and then back to the GPU, which slows everything down and causes FPS drops. This new solution keeps everything on the GPU using CUDA, so the CPU usage stays at 0% and only your GPU is being used. Pretty cool stuff, and I hope they can add that back into OBS in the future, or maybe at least provide a nice graphical user interface to let you like, start a recording, start streaming, or at least just configure what you're recording. The Steam Deck journey continues, with 2100 games now being playable on the not-so-small device. We now have 1,090 verified titles and 1,013 playable games. That's still about 30 games added to the list per day. Big names this time include Metro 2033 Redux, Resonance of Fate, Overlord, Aquanox, or Deus Ex Invisible War. Okay, admittedly this last one blows, but Aquanox, come on! For fans like me of the Polaris RPG, like pen and paper RPG, this was an amazing game. Other good Steam Deck related news, Back for Blood added experimental support for Linux and the deck, and more importantly, Halo the Master Chief Collection now includes the necessary easy anti-cheat files to be playable online, on Linux, and on deck. Unfortunately, it seemed to also have broken the game for some, but gaming on Linux has a solution for that. Link in the description. That's pretty nuts, isn't it? A Microsoft game making changes specifically to be able to run on Linux and on the Steam Deck. It's crazy times we live in. Google detailed the inner workings of Steam on Chrome OS, and it's quite interesting. Steam will run using a virtual machine, which runs a modified version of Arch Linux, specifically designed for gaming. The image is named Borealis and gets updates with every Chrome OS update, so you don't have two systems to manage separately. It also seems to use a very recent version of Mesa to ensure the best performance possible. In fact, Google says that this system offers near-native performance thanks to Venus, a lightweight Vulkan virtualization driver. Basically, apps will use Vulkan and OpenGL, the frames are then passed to xWayland and to Sommelier, which is their Wayland compositor, and finally to Chrome's Wayland display server. Everything should be transparent and seamless for the user, and developers just need to make games for Linux or ensure they run with Proton for them to run on Chrome OS. Hopefully, this will open up the Linux gaming market even more, because Chromebooks seem to be very popular. They already passed desktop Linux in terms of market share. And maybe we'll see more games being compatible with our systems in the future. And, as always, there's a new version of Wine out. Wine 7.6 updates the Mono engine, used to run .NET apps, to version 7.2, and graphics drivers are being progressively moved to the PE executable format to be more compatible. 
It also fixes 17 bugs, including for the crew, the Uplay version, the Oculus Runtime, Silk Road, Tale of the Star Island, or Adobe Photoshop 7. And as always, Wine 7.6 will serve as the basis for the next releases of Proton, so don't you worry your pretty little head about it, you'll get the new stuff soon. Just like you can get some hot new stuff from today's sponsor, Slimbook. These guys are based in Valencia, Spain. They make Linux laptops, Linux desktops, Linux all-in-ones, Linux Nux, keyboards, whatever, you name it, it runs Linux out of the box. I use their laptop, the Slimbook Pro X14, I use their desktop, the Slimbook Chimera, I use their keyboard, the Slimbook RGB keyboard, and well, they've been partners of the channel for a while now, I really enjoy working with them, they make really cool stuff, Head over to the link in the description if you want to learn more about their devices and maybe grab one for yourself. So thanks everyone for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications or to leave a comment. And if you didn't like it, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments as well. If you want to help me make more of these videos, you can also join my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members. Both get access to a weekly Patreon cast every Monday and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover on the channel. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!